please join us as we say prayers for our beloved altar brother, priest monk Peter, but also we will also commemorate Archimandrite Theodore. When we hold the Kaliva, as is customary, everybody huddles together, holds it together, touches each other's shoulder for uh, assurance for one another that we're all one in Christ, both on this side of the dimension and the other side, the spiritual side as well. That's our normal custom, but I'm going to have to ask you not to do that this time and just do it noetically, as they say, mentally, to keep prayers while the clergy will hold the wheat so that we don't all come together and lose our social distancing. <clears throat> Blessed is our God always, now and ever, and to the ages of ages. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. O oh, you who with wisdom profound order all things with love, and who gives to all what is needed for. Holy Creator, give rest, O Lord, to the souls of your servants, for on you have they set their hope, our Maker and Builder and our God. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and ever, and to the ages of ages. Amen. Mili est in epanoi du nezeule, du pomadem miserumitias reste.
Again we pray that the Lord our God will assign their souls where the just repose. For the mercies of God, the kingdom of heaven, and the forgiveness of their transgressions, let us ask of Christ, our mortal King and our God. Our mortal King and our God. For thou art the resurrection, the life, and the repose of your departed servants, O Christ our God. And you we send up glory, together with your eternal Father, and your all-holy good and life-giving Spirit, now and ever into the ages of ages. Spirits of the righteous, give rest, O Savior, to the souls of your departed servants, and keep them in the blessed life with you, O lover of humankind. In the place of thy rest, O Lord, where all your saints repose, give rest also to the souls of thy servants, for you alone are the lover of humankind. You are the God who descended into Hades and loose the chains of the captives there. Give rest, O Lord, to the souls of your servants. Only pure and immaculate Virgin Mary, who without sin did spare God, pray to him that their souls may be saved. Gospody 
Ještě bolím si a pokojený duš, už co všich rabov božích, a kýmanří, to dojí, je, je monach, Petr, i Petr, i o Ježe, prostitý si a jim, jakomu, pregrešení volnu může, i nevolnu může. Gospodí pomíluj, Gospodí pomíluj, Gospodí pomíluj. Jak podá Gospod Bogu činí, duši, kdyži se pravdy pokojajíci a Gospodí pomíluj, Gospodí pomíluj, Gospodí pomíluj. Milosti Boží a Cacstva de Bestovo i ostavdění grěchoví, u Hrista, se směří od Cary Boga našeho, prosím, podaj, Gospodí, Gospodí pomoli však, Gospodí pomíluj, jako ti je si voskresení život i pokoj, u sobči, krav, kojík, archivandrita Teodora i jeromonaka. Petra, Hriste Bože naš, i Tebi slavo oslajem, so beznačalnim Tvojim Otcem i specijatim i blagim, i žodraši Tvojim duhom, nine i pristo, i vo vjeki vjeko. Glory to thee, O Christ our God, and our hope, glory to you. May he who has power over the living and the dead, who himself rose from the dead, Christ our true God, through the prayers of his most holy mother, of the holy and God-bearing fathers, of the holy and righteous Lazarus, whom he resurrected from the dead on the fourth day, and of all the saints, assigned to the abodes of the righteous, the souls of his departed servants, Archimandri Theodore and priest monk Peter, granting them rest in the bosom of Abraham, and numbering them among the just, and have mercy on us all, for he is good and the lover of humankind. Amen. Entru fericita de mie veșnică, o dictă de Doamne, sufletelor adorbiților, rovilor tăi, archimandri Teodor, și ieromona Petru, și folor veșnică pomirire. Veșnică pomenire, Veșnică pomenire. Give rest eternal, O Lord, and bless and recall the souls of your departed servants, and make their memory to be eternal. Rest eternal, O Lord, and bless and repose to the souls of your departed servants, and make their memory to be eternal. <speaking in Spanish> Through the prayers of our Holy Fathers, O Jesus Christ our God, have mercy upon us. Thank you all for coming today to the Holy Liturgy and to join us for this 
Requiem and Panachita for, and uh, Panastas for Father Peter, our beloved Father Peter. This is very awkward time because of the shelter in place order, but we thought this was the best way to allow people to come who wanted to say farewell to Father Peter while his earthly remains are here at the monastery. By doing it today at the liturgy, we can have up to 100 people. But for his funeral, we can only have 25. And by the time you take the bishop and the clergy and the servers and the singers, that's most of the people who could come. We're going to, Archbishop Alexander is coming tomorrow and he will be presiding over the burial rites for a priest tomorrow evening at seven o'clock. It's a private service. I'll have to figure out how many I know for certain are coming. There may be a few slots. If someone really wants to be here, if I can, I will make space for you. But I have to warn you, only 10 or at most 12 could be inside the chapel, and you'll have to be outside, probably. The service tomorrow evening lasts about two hours. It's a special burial service for a priest. The next morning at 10 o'clock in the morning, we'll be having a liturgy, a liturgy for the deceased. So it's actually a liturgy, not in honor of this saint or that saint, but in honor of Father Peter and for the repose of his soul. And that will be, and that will be at 10 o'clock in the morning. And again, with the bishop serving, it will be longer than normal and last about two hours. After that, I'm going to have to leave very soon with Father Peter's remains to the Serbian Orthodox Cemetery in Colma, just south of San Francisco. Their workers leave at three o'clock, so we have to be there in time to put him in a crypt, which I purchased there. So, uh, again, if I don't recommend that you go there because there's no service going to take place there. I'm just going to sing a few party and Actenia while they place him in the crypt. The services are here at the monastery. After I finish saying what I'm going to say, we're going to open up the chapel and we're going to allow you to go in because Father Peter is in the chapel, his earthly remains. And you can only go in at most 10 at a time and you have to maintain social distancing. Those of you who live under the same roof, you can stay together, but between you and others, it needs to be six feet. You can go on both sides of his casket because the lid removes, so you see from both sides. I ask you not to kiss the icons. I ask you not to touch or kiss anything in the chapel. It's very hard not to, that's our tradition, but we're supposed to be intelligent. God gave us brains and not tempt the Lord our God. When you come in, you're going to find Father Peter's face covered. This is our tradition for priests and for monks, that they have a covered, their face is covered with the arion. The arion is the big cloth that goes over the chalice and the discos for the gifts of the bread and wine that are to be made into the body and blood of Christ. The word for sacrament in Greek is mysterion, mystery. Just like in Slavic language, it's is tainstva or taina, even in, in Romanian. The secrets, the mysteries, and the bishops as successors to the apostles are custodians of the mysteries of the faith. And the priests, because they represent the bishops, are also custodians of the mysteries. So his face is shrouded in mystery as the custodian of the mysteries. So please don't lift it off and put it back on and lift it off and put it back on. Please just leave it there. A lot of you don't know Father Peter's background. And I just want to share that with you before I just share a few words. 
Father Peter was 49 years old when he suddenly and unexpectedly fell asleep in the Lord in the emergency room at Kaiser Hospital in Fremont last Saturday. He was born in Shumina in Ukraine near Lviv, close to the Polish border, on April 21st, 1971. He used to tell me it's very easy to remember because it's the day between Stalin's, I mean, Lenin's birthday and Hitler's birthday. Our dear Father Peter always had a sense of humor. He is survived by his parents, Volodymyr Petrovich Didun and Maria Andreevna Didun, and his sister Vera and his brother Ruslan, as well as nieces and nephews all living in or near Lviv, Ukraine. When he came here in 1990, he came to live with his grandfather. His grandfather lived in Wisconsin, and he wanted his son to come, I mean, he wanted his grandson to come to America. And young Father Peter, being about 19 years old or 18 years old, I don't know, spoke no English, had never been away from Ukraine, didn't even know anything about the world. He came to live to a, with his grandfather, and he told me a couple of funny anecdotes. First, he didn't understand America at all, and he just wanted to go back home. And his grandfather said, just stay for a while. It'll grow on you. You'll start to understand. It's a different world, but it takes time. So he stayed. His grandfather came home one day from work, and he rustled around in the refrigerator. He said, I thought I had some cheese here. The state of Wisconsin is known for its cheeses. And he said, oh, yes, Grandfather, it was there, but I, I, uh, I threw it out and spoiled. It had this blue stuff all over it. He said, that's blue cheese. That's good cheese. You don't throw that away. But Father Peter had never seen that in Ukraine. He thought it spoiled. So that's the world he came to when he came to America. But soon after he came with his grandfather, he decided to go to the Ukrainian seminary in New Jersey. St. Sophia Ukrainian Orthodox Seminary in South Boundbrook, New Jersey. It's also the headquarters for their jurisdiction. While at seminary, he was ordained to the subdiaconate on July 28, 1993, by Archbishop Anthony, who's now Metropolitan and head of the jurisdiction. On May 27, 1997, he was graduated and received his licentiate in sacred theology from the seminary. Then he became the driver and assistant for Metropolitan Constantine, who was the chief hierarch of his jurisdiction. Because at that time, he wasn't intending to become a monk. He thought he might get married, but of course you can't get ordained, I mean married after your ordination. So he would just be a driver and work for the Metropolitan until he decided when to marry. In February of 2000, he arrived in California to assist his seminary classmate, priest monk Sviatoslav Kovalov, who was the parish priest of San Francisco at St. Michael's Ukrainian Orthodox Church. But they had a rectory where the priests live in San Leandro, not far from our monastery. And Father Sviatoslav had befriended our Father Theodore. So the two of them came to our monastery often. And later that year, Father Sviatoslav was transferred to the East Coast to help with a new monastery they were trying to establish there in the Ukrainian diocese. But Father Peter had come to like our monastery and he asked Father Theodore if he could stay here. 
He said, but I have to tell you, I'm not sure I, I'm going to become a monk. I never really thought about it before. And Father Theater said, why don't you just come here and live here a while, and it will grow on you. And maybe you'll see it is for you. And it did. It was shortly after that, just a year later or so, that we tonsured Father Theodore tonsured Father Theodore a monk in our chapel. The first monk to be tonsured in our chapel. I was his sponsor, his monastic sponsor. And at a primatial divine liturgy celebrated here in 2009, at this outdoor altar with the Metropolitan Jonah of the Orthodox Church in America, who was locum tenens of our little diocese at the time because our bishop had died, he came here. And Father Peter was ordained to the diaconate at this holy altar, and I was ordained to the priesthood, elevated from being archdeacon at the same service. That was on July 5th. 2009. This is almost the anniversary of that. The following year, on April 14th in our chapel, Archbishop Melchizedek of Pittsburgh and Western Pennsylvania, who was the local tenants of our diocese, because by that time we had three or four dioceses in our metropolitanate without bishops, and poor Metropolitan Jonah was, was local tenants for like three or four dioceses. It was just too much traveling. You couldn't handle it. So Archbishop Melchizedek came for a liturgy in a weekday to ordain Father Peter to the priesthood in our chapel, the first priest to be ordained in Holy Cross Monastery Chapel. I was ordained down here. He was ordained, ordained inside. That was April 14th in 2010. During his 20 years that he was here at this monastery, he built himself into this monastery. For the first 20, 22 years, 23 years of this monastery, when it was just this one property that ended here with the redwood trees and the fence on top of the parking area there. Father Theodore and I, who built the stone walls and the chapel and remodeled the original building and the shrine on top of the hill before Father Peter came, we used to tell ourselves, because we were inseparable, he was, Father Theodore was my spiritual father for 44 years. He was more of a brother than my three brothers, more of a father than my father, and I had a good father, and I have good brothers, but he was better than they were, and he was my very best friend. And six years ago, the Lord called him. And last week, again, Father Peter, who built himself into this monastery over the 20 years he was here. With that, finishing this, we did the middle part. He added the two extensions on both flanks for the mosaics and the front part and added the table, which was not here. He continued to remodel here. He renovated inside and out that building, another property. He never stopped. He was a lover of labor, as we say in monasticism, a Trudeau Lubitz in Slavic languages. And he demonstrated his technical skills as a wonder worker. I used to call him our monastery's Trudeau Tvoritz, Fakator de Minun, because he worked wonders. For the 21 years before he came, Father Theodore relied on me to fix everything, to do everything, because he just didn't have a mechanical aptitude. 
And in 1998, I began work at the law firm, working full time and overtime to support the monastery, coming home with a million things to do, fix this, fix that, unfinished projects here, unfinished project there. And I prayed to God, I said, how can I do both? I'm working 60 hours a week, and I'm supposed to do what I did before I started working. And then God sent Father Peter. Out of nowhere. Very early after Father Peter came here, we were having a dinner at the monastery. And Stefan Zeter was there at that dinner. And I remember he asked us in the presence of Father Peter, how did you find Father Peter? And I spoke up and I said, we didn't find Father Peter. God said, Father Peter. And Father Peter smiled from the end of the table. He said, thank you, Father. Father Peter never thought about becoming a monk. But God called him. And he made it here in a very circuitous way. But once he planted himself here, he became part of the monastery. At one point in the Holy Apostle Paul's epistles, he says, it's no longer I who live, but it's Christ who lives in me. Christ said, if you will save your soul, you must lose your life. You must give up your life to find your life. You must lose your soul to find your soul. And he who's worried about keeping his life will never find his soul. The words for soul and life are interchangeable in the words of the gospel. When we say save our souls in English, we're talking about men in a shipwreck in a lifeboat hoping somebody is going to save their lives. The word is the same in the Greek of the Bible and in many other languages. Father Peter gave up his life here and ceased to matter. What mattered was the monastery, just like Father Theodore did, just like I did, just like every true monk does. You leave this world, you set foot into the world to come, and this is like a halfway point, a bridge. Christ said, he who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is unworthy of me. Once you commit and give up yourself, you lose yourself to become Christ. Not just know Christ, like Protestants say, or have Christ in your heart but to become Christ. This is orthodoxy. We become partakers of the human, of the divine nature, St. Peter says. We become one with the God-man Christ who rose from the dead. When we're baptized, the font represents the tomb of Christ. And we're buried with Christ that we might resurrect with him and share in his resurrection. So like I said, when I lost Father Theodore six years ago, I lost my spiritual father, my brother, and my very best friend. And last week, I lost my spiritual son, my spiritual brother, and my very best friend. But as I often say in orthodoxy, our churches and our monasteries are thin spaces where eternity and time come together with a very thin veil between them. And although there's nothing but earthly remains in our chapel, his spirit is here. He was at this liturgy today. 
one of the greatest spiritual figures in the Orthodox Church, in the English-speaking Orthodox Church today, is a metropolitan Callistos Ware at Oxford University in the Greek Orthodox Patriarchate of Constantinople. Once when he described his journey to the Orthodox Church when he was a young student at Oxford, he went to a Russian Orthodox Church to the great vigil, the all-night vigil on Saturday evening. And there were very few people there. And it was all in Slavonic. He didn't understand it at the time. He did not later. But the one thing he left that church with, he said, it was a large church, and there may have only been 12 people there for the service. But I got this feeling that the church was full. The church was full of angels and spirits of the faithful departed. Father Peter built himself into this monastery. I told you how close Father Theodore and I were. And he used to say, it's really going to be hard when one of us loses the other because no one else is going to understand the one who's left. We're, we're on the same page. We know how we view life, but others don't see it the way we see it. And I said, don't worry, Father. If he calls you first, I'm going to see you built into this monastery. And if he calls me first, you'll see me built into this monastery. Because we're building the kingdom of God here. A little outpost of the kingdom of God in a very dark world. Where there's light, and where there's hope, and where there's comfort for those who are looking for spiritual comfort. When you set foot in an Orthodox church or a monastery, you're setting foot in an outpost, a fortress on the frontiers of paradise. It's a foretaste of the kingdom to come. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, may, his memory, may Father Peter's memory be eternal, and may our Lord grant him the light of life in his everlasting kingdom, and may he receive us all into his heavenly kingdom when he calls us, that we might all feast at that holy sacramental table in his kingdom, in his light, and his warmth. I mean... Oh. Also, although we can't share food and refreshments, this is our tradition, we are going, we did have the blessed wheat. And the county of Alame Alameda says we can serve it in individual servings. We just can't have family style or potluck but it has been put into individual cups. So please, go take the blessed Koliva. It's a symbol of the resurrection. Our Lord said that unless a grain of wheat dies and goes into the earth, it can't bring forth new life. So it's a symbol of the resurrection, our hope of the resurrection. So, and then as I say, we're going to open the chapel doors. Ten of you at a time can go in. As people come out, others can go in, but no more than 10 at one time in the chapel and maintain social distancing. Please, try not to touch anything or kiss anything when you go to the chapel. Please come for the Holy Antidron. Uh, cup your hands right over left, and Subdeacon Lubomir will drop it with tongs into your hands. You can receive the Holy Bread. Mary, Mary.